uh, we're going to talk about right out of the gate. Uh, by the way, we're going to show you the news minute in a minute, but uh, we're going to talk about DeSantis Airlines. Elections update with a local uh, election um, campaign specialist, Jason Carnes. And we're going to talk about a Fresno leader, uh, Buddy Mendez, talking about who will control redistricting after Newsom action? Are they, are they going to be Marxist or what? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, uh, Bullard High School's response to the uh, shooter hoax uh, that happened uh, earlier uh, last week and a, and a massive response from Fresno PD and a great job they did to make sure our students and uh, teachers and faculty are safe. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Let's start with the News Minute with our very own Veronique. Coming to you from the GVR studio, here are some of the trending stories that are making a local impact. An active shooter hoax at Bullard High has raised questions about the way school officials communicated with parents during the frightening campus lockdown. As Fresno City Council President Nelson Esparza fights criminal extortion charges, he'll be represented by a defense lawyer paid for by the city's taxpayers. Fresno County supervisors unanimously approved a record $4.5 billion budget. It includes raises for a number of the county's 8,300 employees. And State Senator Anna Caballero is calling on Governor Newsom to sign her Buy American Bill. It requires California schools to purchase more U.S. grown produce for student meals rather than imported food. Join the conversation on those stories and more now on Facebook and GVWire.com. DeSantis Airlines. Uh, Governor DeSantis of Florida uh, made headlines by sending, uh, I think it was one bus. Load well, of an airplane, start mm -hmm. with an airplane of 50 people. 50 people to, was it Martha's Vineyard or was it yeah, uh, Martha's Vineyard. Washington, D.C.? No, they're talking about going to Biden's home next in Delaware. Okay. But they started with Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, which is under Massachusetts uh, property, yeah. Do so. we have a, a video to show on, on that? Okay, are all three of us on? Okay. Nice promo for this uh, amazing airline, apparently. Yeah, DeSantis Airlines bringing the border to you, right? Okay. If you can't live near the border, or you don't yeah. live in California or one of the southern states, like Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Governor DeSantis and Governor Abbott have decided to bring the border to you. So they flew some um, immigrants to Martha's Vineyard, where the rich and wealthy live. Okay. And so I thought it was very fascinating. I thought it was a, a great stunt. Probably only do it one time. I don't think they're going to take it serious. But it really shows the hypocrisy of the coastal elite uh, in the United States of America. These are the folks that uh, they want your kids to go to crumbling public schools, but they send their kids to private schools. Uh, they want you to not be able to out, go out to your local restaurant, but they go to the French laundry. And the hypocrisy goes on and on. And so when it comes to immigrants, Send them the immigrants and see how they deal with them. And so I think I think it was a great promo right. for so, Governor DeSantis. So I have a really different take on that. I mean, you hit the key word, stunt. I think it completely showed DeSantis' ineptitude to deal with the national immigration crisis we have now. And he's running against Charlie Crist for governor. Mm -hmm. Crist is within striking distance of him. Now, he chose the wrong group. These are Venezuelans. These are people that have been living a life of victimization under socialism. They're coming to this country to work their way into this system. And what DeSantis did by, whether he tricked them or not, sending, it, sending them to Martha's, Martha's Vineyard and putting this into the hands of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, basically he's saying he's not serious about handling this issue if he wants to be president, but he has to become governor again first. And I think Chris big voting block in Florida, mm -hmm. and this kind of thing is fresh on their minds. I think they might take a second look at uh, DeSantis. It was a great stunt, but it was bad for America, I think. Well, at the same time, Mike, we've got an uncontrolled southern border, mm -hmm. right? We've got Kamala Harris put in charge of the southern border. I don't think she knows which direction it is. And so we have today at Fresno County, we talked about fentanyl on the streets of Fresno. Right. It's coming up through the southern border, right? Uh, led by the cartels. They have just have free flow into the United States of America. Now, I have empathy for the Venezuelans and others that are trying to flee real nasty problems. But... Uh, we haven't yet found a way of dealing with them properly here in the United States Agreed. of America. Secure borders are good for important for any immigration policy. But we're never going to get secure borders if we have leaders like DeSantis in the position he's in. 
pulling off stunts instead of dealing with the problem. That's just my take on it. How about you, Darius? Well, um, you know, we need more legal immigration into our country. Our birth rate is getting, uh, our growth rate is getting close to zero. And if we don't get uh, more immigration, uh, we're going to have issue, you know, making, you know, paying for Social Security in about in about a decade, maybe a little bit less. So we need more immigrants that can come in uh, with, you know, bring in dollars, uh, brain power, uh, and labor. I mean, look at the uh, labor shortage that we're currently facing. So uh, I think the the message is nobody has been able to figure out what to do with the 11 million undocumented and we got to deal with that issue. when when should we start that we should have started it five years ago well we did ago. we started building a wall but it yeah, got stopped but, but the, the <laughs> issue yeah and, and and really we we need to deal with the 11 million undocumented and then we need to have mm -hmm. a immigration policy that allows folks to come here legally uh, hey it takes you know it's almost impossible to get a uh, get a h1b visa to come to the states it used to be two hundred thousand a year I think uh, President Trump dropped that to about 30, maybe less than 30,000 folks a year. And these are brainy folks, folks that we don't have access to here in the United States that we go, we're short, you know, these engineers or electronics engineers or whatever they may be. You're implying that the folks coming up through Mexico are not brainy. I no. know that's not what you meant, no, but you know, uh, Robert Wharton yeah, says, right. keep, keep sending them on Facebook Live right now. Robert, I agree with you, um, Inga, uh, fill up all of the planes and send them to sanctuary cities. You know, these cities like Martha's Vineyard, the states like Massachusetts, declare themselves to be a sanctuary city. That's about immigration. And yet when they receive even 50 immigrants, they declare it a humanitarian crisis, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, uh, it shows you the the I amount of the problem. Yeah, and, and I get the, the view. I mean, Robert, Robert said, you know, Democrats control all three branches. Well, I don't think they control the judicial branch. But you're right. This is a call for Democrats and Republicans. If you want to wear your big boy pants and go to the White House, focus on dealing with this national issue. Even Bush 43 said biggest regret of his presidency, and there were quite a few, was never addressing this issue. Um, but in, in the end, this was all a political stunt. And I just don't like victimizing people that have come from socialism to come here. I get the tactic. We're going to scare the crap out of these people that want to come here illegally and they'll never want to come back again. But we're talking about Venezuelans that live in socialism and they want to be a part of this country and they'll work for it. Same as the Italian Americans, the Cuban Americans, whoever you want. And well, half the, uh, half the world lives in socialism. Do you suggest that we just bring them all in? Well, I suggest that we continue supporting regimes that challenge that, like the Ukrainians that want to stop being, stop being run over by dictators and socialists. We have a socialism issue in this country too. We need to cancel that too. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, I think uh, I think we've answered all the questions and we've figured out all the solutions on that. Uh, but it sounds like uh, Governor DeSantis is just one of many GOP governors that's going to be doing an attempt like that uh, to ex export. It's going to be a key election item, it is. right? It's going to yeah. be a big just like issue. Just like Roe v. Yeah. Wade is. Yeah, right? exactly. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, folks. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk about the red wave or the uh, blue wave. I'm not sure what it's becoming. Okay. Let's move on to our elections update with Jason Carnes. Is Jason joining us? Okay. Good evening. Hot races, are you guys more interested in federal, state, local? Let's go local. Yeah. Well, so I would say by far the most competitive local race would be the congressional race. That's pretty uh, high profile between uh, David Valadeo and Rudy Salas. Uh, it is a Democratic district, basically, which is good for Rudy Salas. Uh, David Valadeo has done a pretty moderate stance in some ways. He voted to impeach Donald Trump, and so I'm sure he gets a few brownie points in the middle. But if you look at the numbers, most people think that race is a toss-up. But if you look at 538, which is usually pretty close, they give a slight lean to Rudy Salas. So David Valadeo, he could certainly win, but he will have 
uh, his work cut out for him if he wants to survive. Okay, how about any of the uh, any other local races? Uh, really, there's no city uh, city council race in the city of Fresno, but there, there is, is an assembly race with Esmeralda race. Soria right. and Mark Payson. Yeah. There is another congressional race uh, with Duarte. Adam Gray and uh, John Duarte. But going local, we also have a former council member running for school board in Clovis as well. Clint Olivier. Yeah, right. Okay, let's start off with the uh, assembly race. The assembly race is interesting. Uh, it's a Democrat district again, which gives Esmeralda a slight lead. It was very close in June between the Republicans put together and the Democrats put together, which shows it's a close race. There is more Democrats that turn out in November. So that probably gives a bit of a nod to Soria, as well as the fact that it is hard for Republicans to raise money for the state legislature because they're such a non-entity. And some, so much of the money comes from people who want to have a relationship uh, with the legislators. Uh, but one thing that could possibly be in Payson's corner is our very own Mark, Mike Carbasi, who also does this show, is a relatively moderate Democrat. And so if Payson is able to pick off some of those Carbasi voters, I mean, he could very well win the election. Mike, you're the swing voter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't, didn't the Republican Party just put in several hundred thousand dollars in that race? Several hundred thousand dollars basically is not a ton of money uh, basically for that race. That's a million dollar race basically. And if Payson isn't able to get around a million dollars or so at least, I, I think he's gonna have a hard time because the Democrats, they're gonna throw everything at it and they just have the resources in a way that Republicans for the state legislature don't. I mean, there's not a whole lot that a Republican in the state legislature can do for the interests who give money. <laughs> So that's a that's a really good point that Jason just brought up. Republicans, both in the Senate and the Assembly, hold less than one third of the seats. Right. So really, they're not for any legislation, even the budget. There's no Republican vote that's that's needed. So if you're a Republican in the state legislature, and you can yell you're really marginalized, pretty marginalized. You can yell and scream and laugh, yep. but you can't get anything done. Right. Generally, Generally, depends. You know, we had um, um, Senator, State Senator Andreas Borges. Mm -hmm. He got a few bills passed, uh, helped a pathway in the city of Clovis, for example, and uh, okay. some other great things. So you can, at times, work w across the aisle, but it is pretty rare. I'll give you that. Yeah. Jason, I have a question. Uh, in this race with uh, Councilwoman Soria and Mark Payson, I believe that the Democrat is a 15-point 15 point favorite, or they've got a 15 point uh, margin where they're got of registrations, right. right? So she's got a 15 point um, buffer there, and that gives her a great advantage. Isn't that true? Are you talking about registered voters? Yeah, yes. There's registered voters and there's likely voters. And the more drop off you get, the more conservative the electorate gets. And so the registered voters are going to be the most liberal electorate you'll possibly have. And then after that, it'd be presidential because that's the highest turnout, basically. And then it would be pretty much be a gubernatorial November, which is where we are now, basically, which is a little higher than a primary, but is not quite as high as a presidential. And so the electorate is in the valley is more conservative than the registered voters, those who actually turn out to vote. So that's why you say that this race is close to a toss up. It, Jason, it seems like all three races that you talked about, the Valadeo Salas race, the Soria Payson race, and the Duarte um, Gray race are essentially toss ups. And honestly, Darius, I don't know how to call any of those three races myself. I see it the same yep. way as Jason. Election night is gonna be Tuesday, election night. November 8th. Yep. We're gonna have an election night debate <laughs> on unfiltered. Well, one night on election night, I believe you gave me COVID, so I don't want to. I don't want to hang <laughs> around. Ask Jason, Jason, what are your thoughts on the, the other way around? Any thoughts on the Hurtado race for state senate? Although uh, you mentioned the Gray race, which we hadn't discussed really, I think that leans towards Adam Gray. I think the Republicans are playing chess in that race. They're trying to make the Democrats spend money, but Adam Gray will probably pull that off at the end of the day. And then to get to your question, the Hurtado race, the Democrats got over 50% in that race in June, and Democrats have a better turnout in November than June. And so 
Uh, short of any surprises, it will be close, but Melissa Hurtado should probably pull it off. Great. Inga has got a question. How is the Newsom Dali race? The what? Oh, the governor, race for governor. Inga, the governor I race. I probably didn't recognize the other person. <laughs> okay. All right. Inga. Obviously, okay. if basically as far as it goes, uh, if he could win a special election, a gubernatorial November is pretty much over because a special election has even lower voter turnout. And so that would likely be the most conservative vote you're going to get in California. And if Gavin Newsom creamed a special election, there's really not a chance against him in a uh, actual so, November. Well, we know, we know who helped him. Yeah. Well, and that's the interesting thing. So you talked about Andreas Borges. He's willing to work with everyone. Uh, and be a little bit more relevant. And you, you had that, that, who's the guy that ran for governor against Newsom, who gave it away? Larry Elder. Yeah, Larry. once he got in, he was a godsend because he just drove everyone away from uh, from winning, from, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Well, interestingly yeah. enough, he wants to run for president now. Well, so, there we go. So, so it, and he's, yeah, I've heard him speak. He's got he, He's gonna help us, to Uncle say. Joe win re-election. Well, uh, Mike brings up, brings up a really good point uh, because until Larry Elder got in the race, the the polls showed that uh, Governor Newsom had a high chance of getting recalled, and he had to defend his record. But once Larry Elder got in the race, then it was really the convert that the, the the debate and the advertising turned to, "Do you want another Donald Trump running your state?" Knowing that so the, I've I've met you know, Larry Elder. He's not a bad guy. So or is yeah. your point? You think it's he was too conservative for California. My point is uh, he was too close to Trump, where Trump lost California by over 30 points. Gotcha. Right? Okay. I think so, it's the same as the Hillary thing. Look, yeah. there are people that meet Hillary say she's a great person. But uh, when you know, but for some reason with media, she comes off as a different kind of person and turns people off. Larry Elder did a lot of that with the general electorate, I think. Yeah. Makes so, sense. So the re we have an image of the red wave. I'm going to put that up for you guys. Um, but that's this is nationwide because six months ago the conversation was that the republic in congress but now they may barely take the house by three to four uh points uh three three to four three to four member lead and potentially lose the senate lose a few more seats in the senate so. Yeah, so Jason, what do you think nationally has happened? I mean, we all talk about Roe v. Wade. What do you think really caused that shift? Was it the economy? Is it the recovery? Well, I don't know if Jason's still with us or not, but the red wave. I'm still with you. Uh, well, there it is. It's a blue wave now. Ah. And, and uh, okay. uh, I think, that, I don't know if Jason can hear you, but it's a lot of it. I can hear you. Can opinion, you hear me? Do with the Supreme Court decision. Uh, Hello? That is really galvanizing so many Democrats to vote. Jason, did you hear Mike's uh, question about yes, the I heard him. a factor in uh, basically making the red wave dissipate, become a little ripple? Nation I think that's a huge factor. I think the other huge factor is the fact that Donald Trump just will not go away. Usually a midterm is a referendum on the party in power, basically. And what often happens is it's the party out of power who their voters are all riled up, they're ready to get out there to vote. And those people in the middle, they think the party in power has usually gone too far. And so the middle voters wanna punish the party in power and uh, the people who are out of power are pretty much excited to vote. What has happened this time is that instead of the usual referendum, uh, Donald Trump and the Supreme Court is turning it into a choice basically. And so uh, they have turned off the middle of the road voters and they have Democrats a lot more stirred up than Democrats would normally be in a midterm when they're in power. Uh, those are the two things that I really think have changed the cycle versus the normal cycle. Can I make a case for the red wave making a little bit of a rebound? Okay. Okay. Uh, we know that the Fed- Kind of like COVID. Kind of like COVID. Okay. Come back two or three times. So we know that the Fed is going to raise interest rates again in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. I think people are gonna to start to begin to realize that we're truly in a recession. And that might have a little bit of lag time, but we might see some of the economy really suffering by the time November gets look, here. I'm, I, look, I, as a consumer, I'm feeling it. I mean, you go to buy food, it's at least 30, 40% more expensive. I'm, I myself am having to cut back. I get that. Here's the problem though. 
let's say, you know, it used to be that when you have presidential elections, it's that middle 20, 30 percent that you sway in the general the general election. But with President former President Trump's interference, you were electing candidates that can appeal to the party base, but can't move on and win the general. Same thing happened with those two Senate Georgia seats, which they lost, which I shocked they lost those. That um, is true. I mean, mm-hmm. the, true, the whole idea of Larry Elder, could that be a factor? I mean, I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody. They love Trump. That's fine. But if you want to win and punish, you know, the, what they said, punish the, the party in power, you got to have people that can get elected by the independents or the people in the middle that are going to cross over. I don't see that happening That's right now. That's a good point yeah, about I Georgia. I mean, uh, in the, uh, both were supposed to be Republicans. Then one for sure was going to become Republican. The, the Senate race. Uh, Ended up losing them both. Ended up losing both, mainly yeah. because of Trump's influence. Right now... Right. Uh, I'm going to write this down. Right My now. guess is the Republicans take back the House by four to six. Okay. It's a little bit of a push. It w- the red wave at one point right. was going to be bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to call, call four to six, and we'll do this again yeah. uh, in October okay. before the election. Good. I might I might change that by that time. Right. But right now, I still think the Republicans take the House. Jason, do I have any chance of being correct on that? I agree with you. I think the Republicans will take the House. I think they will probably be ahead by more like 13 votes. And part of that is just redistricting, basically. Uh, the Republicans control more state legislatures, uh, and so they control the process in more states. Uh, more of the Republican states, it's in the legislature. A lot of Democrat states have independent commissions, which takes the politics more out of it. And so the Republicans benefited from redistricting, and they'll probably gain a good 13 votes, I would say, in the House. I think they'll be ahead by 13. Sounds like we need a bill where we can get uh, our own redistricting, kind of like the one we're going to talk about right now. Hey, you know, but Jimmy Martinez said, LOL, Steve is delusional. And I'll take that criticism, uh, Jimmy. But uh, Jason Carnes, who is a essentially a Democrat political consultant, agrees with me. And he says it's going to be even a big, a little bit bigger wave than me. So I can't be that far off. Well, Jason has a pretty good handicap, so I'm not going to contradict Jason. And, and, and actually, that's, that's pretty interesting that, that Jason, a uh, local political consul- consultant, is uh, forecasting a bigger number than you, Steve. Yeah. For, and and that would be a very interesting surprise. Uh, Inga's own uh, analysis shows uh, they're taking the House by 30 and Senate by 4. That's uh, pretty optimistic. They're not going to have the Senate. The, right. The Senate can't yeah. happen. If, uh, Jason, uh, what are your thoughts on the U.S. Senate? Is that going to re- uh, remain 50-50, go to Dem? I believe or? the U.S. Senate will remain Democratic, basically. If you look at the projections, there is only one race that is likely to switch parties, and that is Pennsylvania. Toomey is retiring, and it looks like at this point that Fetterman is probably going to beat Oz. Uh, there are some other competitive races out there, but if you tilt it slightly this way or that way, the other race is still slightly lean to the party that holds it now. And a huge issue is really the quality of candidates in the Senate. I mean, the Republicans really forfeited several Senate seats that could have been competitive by just nominating two far right-wing candidates who cannot appeal to the general populace. Okay. And I think uh, that's going to be a wrap on that item. Uh, folks, you heard it Thanks, here. Jason. Thank you, Jason. You heard it here first uh, from Thank our you. Uh, local political consultant that Republicans will take the House. Uh, Senate sounds like it's going to remain, uh, well, it's not, it's not going to be split. It's going to be become Democrat, potentially. Uh, so a split government, which typically that's what business is like. If the Republicans can take the House, in my opinion, we can stop a good percentage of the crazy lunacy okay. that we see happening right there now. There you go. <laughs> right. You heard it here first on TV mm-hmm. Wire. So let's move on. Uh, Fresno leader. Let's put that image up. I think it's our image number 12. 12. Let's put that up. Um, it's on one of the articles that TV Wire earlier this week. You, um, Steve. Yeah. Comment on this image. And this is a great image. Yeah. Look, I right there yeah. in the back. You're in there. I'm the closest to Gavin. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so tell us uh, what's going on here. So uh, everybody knows that uh, following uh, every 10 year census, uh, we redistrict, right? We're all familiar with that. We talked about it in the House races. So this, uh, after 2020, the county has to do a redistricting process. Uh, there were a lot of people that had input. We did a lot of great. Uh, public outreach. A lot of people had their voice involved, but eventually the supervisors have to vote on a plan. We voted on a plan that many people thought looked too much like the current plan. 
so they did a lot of complaining about it. And um, um, one of our assembly members, Arambula, uh, offered, pro offered a bill to change that and take that decision out of the hands of the supervisors and put it into the hands of a committee. Just in Fresno County? Uh, I think there were a Fresno couple of other Kern. counties. Yeah, Kern as well. Oh, Kern this, as well. This, uh, he, uh, Joaquin Arambula's bill was concentrating on Fresno and Kern County yep. only? Yep. Just to kind of take it out well, of Well, there the were two bills. There was one okay. for Kern, but he was yeah, focusing separate on bills. Fresno. Okay. But same thing, both counties. So, and, uh, you know, we were hoping that the governor would look at it rationally, but, you know, you, you just talked about the the Republicans aren't even a big powerhouse in Sacramento. Right. So I think it's politics, and I think uh, Governor Newsom said, yeah, let's do that. Those of us on the right think that that will tear into uh, the county of Fresno. I think probably uh, Assemblyman Aranda is very happy that the governor signed his bill. And so it won't happen for 10 more years, but we'll see that decision made by a committee. Let me say, we had committees working on that decision this time, and they came up with some very crazy um, options for the supervisors like to what? choose from. Like what? Well, one of them had just take Fresno County and you draw horizontal lines through it and just segregate it by five districts like that. Uh, the, the one that seemed to gravitate the most people towards was a, a, where the five districts all came into the city of Fresno, which would overpower the metropolitan city of Fresno in making that decision so that right now we have uh, two farmers that live out in the far reaches of the county, and we also have Supervisor Magzik who goes all the way up into the foothills. Sal Quintero and myself, we represent the city of Fresno, but this plan that was liked the most by a lot of these committees, they would take all five districts and bring them into the city of Fresno, so that the city of Fresno, in our opinion, would overpower the other half of the people that live outside of the city of Fresno. Very concerning to us, and but it's the governor's choice, and we're going to see what happens. I, I think a lot of this was insider baseball, and, and look, the governor isn't here, so I don't. I'm not going to blame him for this, but he doesn't understand what happens. I can tell you, as a council member, the groups that came and protested our process redistricting, it's not regular folks. It's not people that are out in the community. These are the same interest groups that are going against Measure C right now. It's the same interest groups that just want a bigger piece of the pie, and I get it. That is their their job but they're interest groups. And if we're talking about representing the people, we should be listening to the people. And I worry that there's no way you're gonna get an independent commission. But what you have is with electing seven council members to where right now in Fresno, six are Democrats, more than half are Latino. That's kind of what Dr. Rambula wants. Well, that was done, we redistricted by, by the elected officials voting for it. We had local control. We didn't have to give up local control for that, but a county is different. It's not like a city. And I worry that this is just trying to manipulate the district, the, the, the county to give it to a certain group of people. And that's just not right. That's not, that's, that's manipulative. We at the county, you know, we despise the loss of local control on almost all issues. But every year, uh, Sacramento chips away at local control. You see it, uh, Darius, in the housing sector, right? Yep. They want to take decisions out of the hands of council members like Mike and make those decisions made in Sacramento. So that's an example of loss of local control. This is another loss of local control. Now the county, I'll tell you that we're looking to see if there's a pathway for us to fight this still. It's unclear, we, we don't have the answer to that, but we're gonna look at that. Is, did the city of Fresno have a committee make no. that? No. The city council did? No, we had, I mean, we had a whole outreach effort. There was an independent committee that I was kicked off of from, I told you without a meeting. Yeah. Um, where it was, uh, yeah. Uh, Arias, uh, Maxwell, and uh, Sparza, and they proposed, they brought things forward, and we voted as a council. There was no committee. I mean, how are you gonna make up the committee? That's the problem. It's not, again, you're not gonna get regular folks to volunteer for this thing. It's gonna be people from so, interest so groups. So why didn't uh, Assembly Member Arambula have a committee, his bill include City, uh, city of Fresno as well? Well, well he's happy could. with the result. Yeah. See, that's why I say oh. it's political, okay. right? Happy with the result. I can tell you that the, process that the county went through was even more robust than what the right. city of Fresno went through. But okay. that doesn't matter when you have a political okay. outcome that you want to see happen. So I think he was probably happy with what happened at the city. He's got many friends there, but over at the county, it's uh, he's on the different side of the aisle. So he found a different pathway to get his way, which is to uh, yeah. twist the governor's yeah. arm. Okay. All right. Politics at play at every level. And uh, you heard it here first, folks. Okay, uh, next item.
And one of the last items we're going to cover, Bullard responds to shooter hoax, highlights communication flaws. That's what parents are saying. Uh, did you know there was uh, SWAT folks at Bullard High School last week? Oh, yeah, for that darn yes. call. Yeah. 40 units. And the, what really helped was having an SRO on campus, an officer on campus to communicate with them. The response from our department wasn't like Uvalde. It was very swift. And I'm really, really proud of Chief Valderrama for making sure our brave men and women in uniform are trained to go into harm's way because they didn't know if it was real or not. They just knew there was a call for help. So here's an image of inside Bullard High School. Uh, and luckily, it was just a hoax and nobody got hurt, uh, but a, a incredible rapid response by Fresno PD. Mike, you were thanked by the chief for helping get more law enforcement sure. into the city of Fresno, so we're grateful for that, for your sure. efforts. And I think the Chief Valderrama acknowledged that, uh, and, and that would help the rapid response. But So this kind of brings up the question, uh, I think this image, if I'm not mistaken, was taken by one of the students with their camera. With their cell phone. How would you like to be that student? I mean, you find out, you know, a little while later that it's a hoax, but can you imagine being a student looking at that? Well, can you imagine being a student looking at that and not being able to communicate with your parents? <laughs> right, right. But, but yeah. you see, Darius, and we're, we're going to keep talking about this issue, but this right here, this ability to respond, this is the number one job of a city council. It's not extorting people, it's not playing games and going to court. Yeah. And we'll talk about that later. This is the job, and we're, we're starting to lose sight of that, unfortunately, with all these. These, these political distractions. Uh, Linda Samuelian put in uh, her comment, I love the, re uh, the reaction of my daughter when she saw this outside her class. She said she felt safe. Uh, well, that's good. Yep. That, that's and uh, you gotta response. say, even though it was a hoax, excellent response right. by Chief Balderrama and his team, right? No, exactly. I mean, it's a fantastic yeah. response. Unlike what we saw uh, late la or last year, right. you know, so, where the cops were unwilling to address the problem. So here, here, I guess, you know, we're going to invite um, Bob Nelson again to the show for the, I think, the 10th time. <laughs> and we want to ask, are, is Fresno Unified ready? Or have they gone through, trained the teachers, trained their staff, if there's an act of sure? We, we need to find this out. And, and I'm hoping that the uh, principal of Bullard High School will join us uh, soon over the next uh, few weeks to kind of tell us the, the plan. Uh, Bullard has been in the, in the spotlight uh, several times over the last uh, uh, few weeks on the cell phone ban. And now um, Principal Armin Terigian is going to, has been conferring with parents, is going to roll this out. But it looks like October 3rd is when it's going to get but, rolled out. You know, and I think that's, that's the way it should have been from the beginning. Like people, they're not saying we agree or disagree, just include the parents, especially I can tell you, in Northwest Fresno, our voters, I mean, you've been representing them for a long time. They want to be included in these decisions. They, 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 I feel like they're not just gonna say, okay, you're elected, we're gonna trust you to do whatever you gotta do. They want you to always have their consent to do things. And this is a bit of a surprise to a lot of folks. One thing that shocked me, and no matter how you agree or disagree with the district, Bob Nelson's a very nice man. I mean, I, I truly mean that. But he did something that shocked me at the press conference twice. He specifically mentioned that this must be, the hoax potentially could be someone who's local and upset with the new cell phone policy. And I know that we got into the political debate here, but the chief had just said it's more likely someone that's international or someone national, it's a nationwide trend. And I, I, I wish he'd come here and talk about that because that was a bit uncharacteristic for him. I don't know, did you notice that, Steve? Yeah, I heard that. And, and remind me, when does the cell phone ban start at Boulder? October 3rd. I think it's October okay. 3rd. Okay, yeah. so I don't know, you know, I don't know why uh, he would suppose that that was, you know, somebody from the other side, somebody that opposed that particular ban. But it is what it is, and it proves a lot of points. It makes a lot of parents nervous when that call comes in, and uh, the, I think they still want to be connected to their children. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, next item. I guess this may be the last item. City of Fresno hires prominent attorney to defend council president. A taxpayer defense. Three. There were three. So you kind of tell us, tell us about what's going on there. I don't know what the hell's going on anymore. I'll be honest with you, Darius. I'm disgusted. Um, I'm. Sp I don't know what to say. Like honestly, what what bothers me the most is the talking out of both sides of the mouth. It's well, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna sue Bredefeld because I don't want taxpayers paying for it. 
Yet when it comes to a criminal case, I've looked, we have never once paid for the criminal defense of an elected official. It has never happened in this city. It's happening now. And now they postponed the arraignment. They're tr it looks like they're trying to get the testimony of the victim, which in this case was Doug Sloan, thrown out saying it was privileged. I don't know if that stunt's gonna work. Um, but I, I don't know, as a Democrat, it really bothers me because usually we fight for victims. And now everyone's saying it's politically motivated and all these all the smoke screening. Look, this is a legitimate question. I am one of the three council members who was, I hate to use this word, victimized by this. I have a job to do. And Mr. Esparza, in my opinion, felt that he had a right, which is against the charter, to say, if Carbasi asks you to do anything, you don't do it and you come to me. And if you don't, you lose your job. That's not right. That is extortion. And that's why I've lost a lot of respect for him. And I can't take him seriously anymore. And now he's, like he said, he wants to get his bills paid by the city. And of course he's going to appeal it. He doesn't have to pay for it. Right. And so I always like to uh, go back to the basics on these stories because we've talked about them a couple of times, but there's a good chance somebody hasn't heard this yet. So um, the council president walked into the office of the city attorney and said, hey, essentially, you're working for me and the majority of council. These other three council members, which included my friend Mike Carbasi, by the way, these other three council members, you're not working for them. If they ask you to do something, you've got to come clear it from us first. And oh, by the way, if you don't do this, your job's on the line, right? And so um, by hook or by crook, that information came out. Uh, it was, you know, uh, Doug Sloan has said that that's what was told to him. So it's potential extortion, right? Now, whether it's provable in a court, I don't know. That's outside, that's outside of my pay grade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we have some video um, from the trial today and some, te some, some statements that were made. If we can get that on right now. And while they're doing that, no, you're you're right, Steve. I mean, it's uh, it, it's something I, I never thought I'd, I'd I'd deal with something like this at City Hall. It's pretty crazy, but uh, it just gets worse and worse every day. It's that what political limbo I talked about. How low can you go? <laughs> okay. So here we go. Uh, listen, for uh, for my part, I continue to be uh, very humbled by the outpouring of community support uh, that we've received and all the folks who showed up today uh, on our behalf. I think uh, most folks in the community see this case uh, certainly for what it is, but we are very, uh, uh, we're pleased to be uh, on the road towards uh, resolving uh, this case and having finally engaged and started the process. Thank you. The whole gravamen, the whole issue with regards to the case is that Doug Sloan is the attorney for the entire council. As such, he represents each one of the council members. Um, and so he is considered by statute and by ethics to be Mr. Esparza's attorney. And so anything they said during the course of that meeting was covered by the attorney client privilege. If Judge Capitan does not agree that he should dismiss this case because of the attorney client privilege, where do you go from there? What's the defense beyond that? Well, we either contemplate the issue of whether or not we're going to file an appeal, whether an appeal is available then, or whether we go to prelim and then appeal it after the prelim. So basically the aim is for him to never actually be arraigned? Yes. Uh, we were actually disappointed that the date was out as far as it is. Uh, Mr. Esparza is anxious to litigate this case and to get it to trial as quickly as possible. Does it, because a sitting sitting council member, does it hurt his uh, image with the public when he has to go through a criminal arraignment? I, you know, I mean, anytime anybody is charged with a crime, it, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, something that they think about and it's something that, you know, is an image but in, a problem. But in this case, given the acrimony among the current council. I think a lot of people have an understanding what this is about. And so I don't know okay. that it hurts yeah, his I image. Just comment. Um, Mr. Coleman is very misinformed. The agreement he has with the city and the taxpayers is a public document. There was no leak of confidential information. That is absolutely wrong. Um, when we enter into a contract and we pay, the taxpayers have a right to see that document. And you can ask our attorneys that they will tell you that is a public document. So for him to push more conspiracy without, without knowing the facts, it's very disappointing. And if that's what the $350 an hour is getting taxpayers, geez, that's not a very good deal. Question, how much does tax attorney cost? Well, so the main attorney is 350, and he had two other attorneys with him. That's another 250, so it was 850 an hour. Wow. 
-hmm. Look, I, I have not been told, and I don't know if I can even disclose how much it's going to cost taxpayers. I think it's a fair question. The lawsuit where he was accusing Bredefeld of, a, of uh, a defamation, that cost about $25,000, wow. um, which is a lot of money, a lot of sidewalks. And we don't know yet. Um, and that's when he said he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want taxpayers on the hook. And I'm sure this is a lot more than 25 grand. Yeah, yeah Robert says the lawyer will be laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, open checkbook uh, for, the, on the, for the taxpayers. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, a, a last comment before we wrap up, Mike? No, I mean, look, the bottom line is um, I had a decent working relationship with Nelson. This whole thing is pretty much shot that. And um, it's really unfortunate because I think that he had a, you know, he, he, well, anyways, I think he had a bright future. I think he shot himself in the foot. I think that they're going to try and say this is politically motivated and try to get out of it however way they can. And they have a blank check to do that, unfortunately. And this, uh, Inga, is another question. Has, Mike, uh, has this case received any national attention? Um, I, I don't know. know. Not that I'm aware okay. of. All right. No. Okay. Uh, and that's a wrap. Uh, we're going to do a very brief uh, closing statement. We'll start with you. So I'm, my closing statement is going to be about Governor DeSantis. And I say, Governor... And Governor Abbott keeps sending the immigrants to the sanctuary cities. They've declared that they want them, even though that they've proven uh, light, uh, the opposite is true. But I think it's a good move. And I think the American citizens that are plagued with an overwhelming amount of these problems are glad to see uh, that problem dispersed around a little bit. Okay, Mike? No, I just look, thank you for watching. Uh, these, these shows are getting really exciting. Uh, thanks to Jason Carnes for being on talking about his take on politics and the races. Um, yeah, look, when it comes to the city council, I used to tell people I'm proud to be a council member in Fresno. I'm proud to do my job, but it, this is so embarrassing what's happening. And, and you know, I think people, the, the regular folks out there, the voters, they're pretty disgusted. And I think our reputation is shot. And a lot of us that are serious about this job have a lot of work to do to restore that confidence. And, and, and we're gonna do that. Cool. Thank you, Mike. And. Uh, you know, I have uh, two comments to make. We had a big red wave uh, that, is, that is now kind of becoming a flicker. Uh, sounds like uh, between four, that's Steve's number, and 12 uh, uh, members uh, will be the majority, uh, will, will, uh, will be the, the, the delta of the Republicans who will be between four and 12 in the House of Representatives uh, this fall. Um, and, and that's a diff really a diff very different story here in California, where Republicans don't have any control in the state legislators. So what we can, uh, can, can concentrate on is we really are our local control. Uh, you brought that up, Steve. And uh, our, our local races and uh, what we do, who's, who we send to Congress, to the state legislator, and to city council, and also to school boards. And with that, I'm gonna uh, just wrap up with the board issue. I, I did not attend Bullard. I uh, went to high school in Iran uh, growing up there, but Bullard is very uh, close to my home and uh, school safety is exceptionally important. Thank you, Mike, for getting uh, more officers in, in, in the city of Fresno uh, to help with that rapid response. And the conversation on school, sa school safety and uh, student safety is going to continue. Uh, we hope to get uh, Principal Armin Turrigan on the show in the coming weeks to uh, discuss his plans and the parental in involvement uh, in rolling out his plans for uh, student safety, really, and teacher safety at Bullock. Thank you, have a great week, and see you all next Tuesday.